the sword is a symbol that has been very important in Europe for a long time. It's at the core of pretty much all our mythology and all the literature and stories that we have. The first time anyone ever holds an actual steel sword. The look in their eyes from you know, very small children to old ladies and everyone in between. There is a certain magic about that moment. There are so many reasons that people join HEMA and so many reasons that they stay in HEMA. The, the people who join are usually interested because, firstly, there's swords. I think that doesn't need explanation. Swords, oh my gosh, swords, we love swords. Everybody loves swords. The uh, people who come in are interested in learning something and the people that stay find what they're looking for. I couldn't really describe, per se, why I love it so much. It's just, I can do it forever. It's mentally challenging as well as physically challenging. It sort of has an all-around um, <laughs> workout of the body and the brain. I love the, the community more over than anything, just the how humble the fighters are and wanting and willing to help each other. And, and it's more like we're brothers in arms. But past that, it's just the martial aspect, the, the techniques, what you can do with weapons that are this length or longer or even shorter. People get drawn to HEMA usually because there's something about the source material that is exciting or romantic to them. If you just want to learn how to fight, there's a million places and disciplines that you can learn, that you can do that. So people see the sword and they think, wow, I want to be like that guy in that movie that I loved when I was 12 and secretly still love now. I remember one time I ran into someone from high school and I was just, I was pulling into my parents' house and he was across the street and we just got to talking about where we are in life and what we're doing and of course, Hema came up and he said, oh yeah, I've gone to a couple of those groups, you know, that do the reenactment and I've gone to LARPing and we fight with swords too. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know, do you want to see my stuff? Of course, I always have my gear in my trunk of my car and I pulled a long sword out and I pulled a rapier out and I was showing him and just his eyes got big and he was like, oh, this is not what I thought you were doing when you said you do HEMA. You know, one of the beautiful things about HEMA is that there are various aspects that appeal to different people. You know, some people you know, love the, the physical objects, the swords, the history. I like languages, I like the books, the fun athletic parts of the competitions. But very much so, you know, the scholarship isn't, it isn't divorced from, from the practice. The scholarship very much drives HEMA. By doing this, it connects us to the past. It creates a context that is a bit anachronistic in the modern world, but that's also the appeal of it. We want to do this because it's part of a heritage and a tradition that uh, people are missing in a modern world where everything changes all the time. The historical European martial arts are those fighting systems, those martial art forms, to use a word to define itself, which, which originated or were widely practiced in Europe at, at some point. That historical period for us usually means you know, Victorian era backwards. Mancellino in 1531 makes a distinction between uh, sal play and a fight with sharps. And Mm. And for a fight with sharps, he says, keep your point out and snipe their hand, basically, mm. is his advice. Very much like 133. Um, well, there's a, a remarkable European literature on how to fight from about 1300 onward, right into the 20th century. We have people writing books on how to fight. Dozens and dozens of books over the course of several centuries throughout Europe. Some of these arts have died out, some of them have evolved into other things, so you know, the modern sport of fencing, the modern sport of boxing, are the direct descendants of these martial arts, but they're not practiced as they were back in the day. In sports fencing, when your coach gives you a technique to practice, you practice that technique, and he got it from his coach, and this goes all the way back to, to when the art Create, was created or, or over time it evolves and changes but you know you've got it right because your coach tells you to do it and he says yes you've got it right and that doesn't happen in HEMA or at least in first generation HEMA that hasn't happened because we've got a source material and we've got nobody that's able to say this is how the technique is done. At its core is the reconstruction of, of, uh, of European martial arts through source material. The uh, research and the study of the old manuscripts and the application through drilling, technique training, sparring and competition. It's a very, very large term that often gets caught up with swordplay because that's the most prominent and common aspect of it, but it's an enormous, enormous umbrella. HEMA covers so many different weapons. I don't even know that we can really reasonably 
put all of HEMA into a box. There are unarmed forms. We have grappling and wrestling forms. We have grappling and wrestling forms that intersect with weapons forms. We have weapons forms that existed just a few hundred years ago and may have been practiced as late as our great grandparents. And we have forms that, that go back hundreds of years. Generally speaking, well, we um, have HEMA starting with the uh, antiquity. We have friends to do uh, gladiatorial combat, for instance. You're looking at weapon sets such as sword and buckler, and then longsword in the earliest periods, wrestling, use of the dagger against the dagger or unarmed against dagger, use of pole weapons such as spears, halberds, pole axes, and then as the swords develop through side sword into rapier and then from rapier into small sword, in that same period you start to see saber and back sword come in as well. And of course there's mounted combat all through that period as well. You know, there's such variety that everyone finds something that appeals to them. The level of variety that you see in the martial arts that people know about today, that's the same level of, of variety that really is available for weapons as well. This kind of sword is called a montante. It comes from Spain and Portugal and Iberia in general. You also find swords like it in Italy and elsewhere throughout Europe. The style that's used with the quote silver is that it's used very much like a short staff. Its tradition is a little different from a lot of the Germanic traditions in that it deals quite often with a lot of simple strikes and fighting against multiple opponents with an emphasis on solo drills rather than attack, defend, attack, defend, attack, defend because of the unsafeliness of even a blunt version of this weapon. Forward. Back. 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 Sit down. The Montante was used by frontline combatants, marines, people protecting other people, and generally any situation where someone found they'd be at a disadvantage and fighting against multiple opponents. Just part of why it developed actually was that in Spain during the Reconquista, one of the biggest problems they had was that the armies of the Moors outnumbered the Spanish and Portuguese so much. So having developing systems of combat that were useful against multiple opponents was a very big problem. Today, right now, maybe there are fewer of them that are actually practiced, and, it, and that has different explanations. There's more source material about some weapons than about others, but it's also just about hype and popularity. Within HEMA, it seems like more people practice longsword than, than any other art. The longsword is the main weapon of that period and a sign of honor and courage and chivalry, if you want. This is the reason that people are interested in HEMA to begin with, I think is that we live in modern times, and in modern times, we change everything all the time. Like, there's always the latest thing that you need, the new iPhone, the new whatever it is. And we do that by discarding everything that is old, in a, you know, in a way. So, uh, when we've discarded that, we tend to feel a bit, you know, rootless. And I think that is part of the reason why so many people are interested in HEMA, because there's a link that ties us together with our ancestors through these sources. You can read these manuscripts and old texts and hear the voices of old fencing masters. And it also is a manifestation of a different type of society with other values where, you know, honor and courage and so on are, are very important aspects of, of everyone's lives. As we progress and we find new material and we interpret that and put it up to be available for the public and people pick up this material and run with it and start practicing and become more efficient at it, you want to see other weapon systems gaining in popularity. Which is, you know, one of the really, really exciting things. The idea that maybe one day I will actually learn how to be a good sickle fighter. That'd be pretty awesome. What we have in the sources is these different here between fighting in armor or fighting without armor not speaking of very specific techniques or very specific sources, but we have mentioned uh, in several manuscripts of this technique might not work if your opponent has armor, or this technique works better against armor. So the differences between armored and unarmored combat, uh, some of it is weapon. Armor worked. Uh, that's what it was built for. It was built to keep people from stabbing you or chopping you into pieces. And when you're studying an art that focuses on stabbing people and chopping them into pieces, you have to find some way to win that arms race. 
So in some cases, it was done with things like pole axes. And so we see within, within the German sources, the pole axe, uh, or for that matter, the Italian sources, as a weapon used to kill a guy who was wearing armor. And there's uh, folks out there who spend a lot of time focusing on, that, on those materials, on that technique, learning to do that effectively. If you're just looking at a longsword, and how does a guy with a longsword fight a guy in armor? We have a series of techniques, generally called harness fashion, harness fighting, right, armored fighting, which includes stuff like half sorting, or the armored hand, which is to grab your sword's blade somewhere you know, halfway along the blade, you know, hand on top of sharp blade, glove or no glove, whatever, and then to use it essentially as a very small spear, and we begin to see overlap in poleaxe techniques and, and hooking and otherwise using the, the weapon as an object to not just stab or chop your opponent, but to manhandle your opponent so that you can create an opening in a place where the armor is weak, maybe in the armpit or in the elbow or, or deep inside the, the gauntlet, and then work that point in there and then drive it, drive it in to cause some kind of damage to your opponent. Brandy attempting to get up into that, uh, into that bicep again. Shreth's not giving any, uh, any space. Attempted a wrench over with a pommel, oh! and the point went in. Looks like it went up underneath the right arm pit. Right. Uh, it also pulled his mail out of the other thing. It's a little bit like jujitsu. It's a little bit like grappling. It's about position, you know, position before submission, working yourself into a, a place where you can get that point right where it needs to be, driving it in, and then really sinking into that advantage. Incidentally, in the armored section of the medieval wrestling corpus is where we have all of the groundwork. So medieval ground wrestling is armored wrestling. The reason being, often armored encounters would be encounters to the death. You basically had to follow it through unless somebody gave up, but generally not. So we have um, quite a few number of pins, a number of locks, a number of ways to hold a man down so that you can draw your or his dagger and um, try to get at him in his armor once he's on the ground underneath you. It's something that, that operates, while philosophically perhaps similar to Blasvestian or unarmored fighting, mechanically it works very differently. It looks nothing like the armored combat that we see in, in shows or on television or, or any other kind of place. Uh, it looks, to the untrained eye, I think probably a little bit more like a brawl. And to the trained eye, it looks like something infinitely less like a brawl than what we might see on our, our favorite television show. A lot of prejudices about uh, historical combat, a lot of misconceptions come from film. Um, and at the same time, film is the reason, I think, why a lot of people started with Yima, because they were inspired by, by seeing the sword on the screen. The age-old conflict between fighting for effectiveness and fighting for story, it's so hard to get both right at the same time. The filmmakers lack the, the knowledge and the form language to make their actors look like convincing fighters. So they will often use camera tricks and editing tricks to make the fight scene look violent, but it doesn't necessarily make a very compelling action scene. This is what a lot of HEMA people see as bad, like you don't really see the, uh, the fighter in the actor, you see an actor with a sword. If you look at the lightsaber fights in Star Wars, the sequence is purely aesthetic. It's a collection of well choreographed moves. It's more of a dance than that is a fight. You can actually see that there is no real sense of danger. The problem in a fight is, it's, a lot of it is about feel. And when you're showing somebody a fight, you have to exaggerate. But if you're exaggerating in a fight, you're showing your enemy what you're going to do. So the two don't go well together. Nordevind is a historical European martial arts club which focuses on combining HEMA and authentic historical fighting systems with entertainment, such as live show and film. So what you see in, in other kind of movies like, uh, like Asian martial art films, there is great aesthetic quality to the way they fight, because there is a fighting system there, and the, the performers are very well trained in that system. So Hima has this form language, has this, this innate beauty, and this is what, at Nordevind, we try to achieve. And even though people are not looking for Hima coordinators or Hima choreographers per se, once you are at the position in which you can call the shot as a Hima person, uh, then you can sneak Hima in. 
Taking something from a source into real life, into a training environment is really going to be about experimentation. I think it's really important to think about this as a, you know, an evolving iterative process. First you have to choose, are you going to have that manual translated into your language or are you going to learn that language yourself, uh, unless you're already a native speaker. But even if you're a native speaker, it's, it's not easy for you to, to read your own language when it's 500 years old. Step number two is trying to understand what the author means, uh, understanding key phrases, because a lot of times there's a specific fencing vocabulary that, that this author is using. You're going to get together with a training partner and work together to try to make what you just read happen. And I think that it's very important to really work with it. Do something and then talk about it. Okay, well, that isn't what the master described. So how did we mess this up? So you have to go back to the beginning, start again, and just keep going until you think that you've found something uh, that works. You're never given all the information. Sometimes you're assisted with pictures or illustrations, sometimes not. Usually we have text but sometimes not. So you have to try to take what you're given and turn it into something useful. For example, a certain kind of cut might be described as coming from a certain place, perhaps on the right shoulder, but it comes from above. The text might say which edge to use, and it might describe the end result, that you're trying to hit the person in the head. But what it does not tell you is how to get from here to there. There's, there's places that we have to be speculative. There's places where we have to try out different theories and different ideas and see how well they fit the sources. It's very difficult once you've built a model that works 90% of the way, and then you find out what the rest of the 10% of this way you thought this technique was going to work doesn't really work at all. Being able to go back repeatedly and continue to evolve your ideas on how some of these techniques work I think another thing that is important to me is a willingness to go back and say, huh, guess what, we were wrong, um, you know, we have a better way. One example of changes in how we see things is the reversed grip, for example. We had all these images where people are holding the, the swords with these types of, of positions, right? Uh, we didn't know what they meant. We felt like, okay, so they were just really crappy at drawing hands. <laughs> but that's probably not the case. And the funny thing about that is that once you understand that you can reverse the hands, you can use different hand positions, it changes a lot of interpretations. I have one interpretation where it says you put your hands in front of your face, and I just felt like it was like you're having a, you're holding it like this. But when I changed the technique, I realized it was actually, you know, holding it like this in this position, which opened up entirely new ways of using the sword when parrying and so on. So you have the data, you build a model, and you really need to test that model. And this is why things like tournaments and sparring are really important from my perspective. It's this balance between the practice of it, trying to understand what seems to work, what doesn't work, and then going back to the data and saying, okay, well, Here's what my practical experience is. This is my theoretical understanding. You know, where's the mismatch? Either you're doing the technique wrong or your partner's giving you a pressure which isn't correct for that move. So is that pressure then able to be corrected by another technique? That fallibility in you and your partner eventually leads to you understanding the system more fully. But then you need to be able to apply it as well. And not all manuals have instructions of how to train it. Pierre has this habit sometimes I'm not really telling you what to do, but just telling you how awesome it'll be if you pull it off. The historical European martial arts sources, I would say, roughly divide into treatises and manuals. A treatise being essentially an advanced written study on a topic which the reader is already expected to know something about. Here's your textbook, here's your lesson, here's how you remember to do all this stuff that you paid me to teach you how to do. Whereas if we take at the other end of the spectrum a uh, World War I bayonet manual, that is really written for uh, teaching soldiers who know nothing about bayonet fighting. These books came from as many different kinds of people as there were books. They weren't just written by knights, they weren't just written by commoners, they weren't just written by masters. Some of these were written by men like Agrippa who were not masters at all, but perhaps just talented fencers that had a method of fencing they wanted to share. We have Joachim Meyer who writes his thorough descriptions of the knightly art of combat. He writes this for a general audience, but it helped get him a job as a fencing master for a duke. 
medieval treatises were made for a wide range of different reasons, sometimes just to document a system as a record uh, for an archive, almost for personal use. We know sometimes it was written as a form of advertising, sometimes as a status symbol. That was very common. The very rich and the highest in society had their own swordsmaster and they created a work almost as an expression of wealth in the same way that today you'd have a yacht. Even through the 15th and 16th centuries we see a a wide range of reasons why treatises and early manuals were created uh, and also a gradual evolution of the reason for them being created. You have to understand that the people who could afford that source material were already at a certain level of society. They're not the people who are going to be chopping up fish to sell. They're not the people that are going to be trying to fight their way in the slums in order to live. And ironically, those people are probably in, engaged in more fighting and more violence than the people that the books were aimed at. So understanding the surrounding culture to the source material is just as important as understanding the material itself. So, you know, a master that's you know, more focused on school play will give different advice than a master that's focused on self-defense. You've got the two books of Giganti. So his first book is you know, very nice fencing in the line. His second book is defending yourself against multiple opponents, dagger against spear, grapples, pommel strikes. And so very much like the modern human context where it's very libertarian in nature, everybody has a voice, everybody has an opinion, everybody gets to throw out what it is that they think is right. A lot of these fight books came from the same place. They came from historical masters or would-be masters throwing out their ideas about fencing in written format, hopefully for people that were paying for them or that were going to be able to use them. And even that isn't the kind of thing I can really tell you is, is what happened, right? We don't know. Uh, what we do know is that they were kind enough to write all this down for us and to let us argue about it on the internet incessantly for the next, you know, 100 years. It's very hard to simulate a sharp sword in a fight because sharp swords were designed to hurt people and kill them and cut them open in all kinds of awful and horrible ways. We don't want to do that in a club. We like our training partners. We want to go home and live to fight another day with them. So to simulate the thing that we are training for in a safe way is a huge challenge. The most common weapon used is the steel fader or the steel blunt. Fader is a modern name for it, but a steel blunt practice sword that has safe rounded edges and flex to it so you can thrust. That is what most people use across all weapon disciplines. But if you have a big club with a lot of beginners, uh, they might not be able to afford a, a steel weapon immediately or they are unsure if they are willing to dedicate themselves for some reason in loaner uh, weapons, then nylon or plastic weapons are available too and that's excellent. We didn't have a way as a community of introducing new people quickly and cheaply into the art, which is how ultimately it was going to grow, was by saying, look, you don't need to go out and buy a specialist steel sword, you can have something which will allow you to practice. The Rawlings range came about through me phoning up lots and lots and lots of different manufacturers, anybody who had an interest in reenactment, anyone who could supply weaponry. And it serves its purpose. Most of us move directly from those onto steel or onto things like black fencer or things like this. In my opinion, you want to progress to steel weapons uh, as quickly as you can. I think there's a lot of value in that, partly because they handle better, but also partly because you're doing fencing and that should be done with a weapon that is approximately the real deal. So there's an identity thing to work with steel weapons as well. I've been blessed with many occasions to go through handling session with originals. I try to not exactly copy the shapes of the originals, but I want to copy the feel of the originals. For creating a safe blade to fence with, we need to adjust a few things. We need thicker edges, we need flexibility, we need a button on the tip. All of these will alter a little bit the geometry of the blade. So if I copy the exact measures of an original and I add those features for safe sparring, it will probably not give you the same feeling of the original. The races are there are some races that are typically the same as they were 500 or 1000 years ago. One or two such races are there, but the reason is that the races are still very efficient and in the right amount of time for the right amount of time to be able to use the modern techniques. There are some people who are very important that the traditional and traditional traditions are ready to be used, and the traditional card is ready to be used. This is also possible, but there is also the desire vívók felől, hogy a lehető legjobb áron, a lehető leggyorsabban elkészüljenek a jó kardok, mert ez a legfontosabb. 
This is the lost second book of uh, Nicoletto Giganti. Nicoletto Giganti is one of the most celebrated um, Italian fencing masters, Italian rapier masters of the early 17th century. His first book of 1606 was um, very well known and very widely distributed and celebrated for centuries afterwards as one of the most clearest, you know, most concise representations of the Italian method. In his first book, he'd promised to write a second, but for centuries it it was unclear if this had ever taken place. In fact, as early as 1673, a Sicilian master, Pallavicini, in bringing out his own second book, essentially derides Giganti by saying, I didn't promise to bring out a second book, but here it is, unlike people like Giganti who promise a second book but never deliver. So, you know, you know not even 70 years after the publication of Giganti's first book, his second book was already regarded as, you know, mythical. New sources are still being found, and they're being found from a variety of places. Uh, in the early days of this reconstruction, the early modern days, I should say, they were largely found in museum collections. Um, and that is still an ongoing process. Many museums have a lot of information still not even cataloged, much less, um, you know, available to the public. I had when I started out when I was a teenager uh, this idea about famous men, uh, famous researchers of today like uh, Matt Gallas and Steve Hicken, the, the many uh, before them as well, Hans Peter Hills and so on, uh, walking around, walking with a torch down a catacomb and finding these this dusty old manuals. And I'm sure it's, that also happens. Fortunately, uh, a lot of museums, uh, for reasons of preservation and, and various other things, are putting more of their information online. A lot of times you find these manuals just by typing in different, different spelling variations of key, key phrases in Google, in Google Books. Which makes it accessible to more researchers rather than just the two or three that can get to the museum and have the language skills and so on. The internet um, has really changed you know, research in a dramatic way and, and largely for the positive. There are genuine researchers who find new material who, who make new discoveries about existing material. You've got guys like Matt Gallus, uh, Pier Marco Terminello. Uh, these guys are, are actual researchers doing original research, which is very valuable. Then you have guys like Michael Chittister and the crew over at Wichtenauer, who are not necessarily doing research, but they're making the material available to us, which is infinitely valuable, like the most valuable thing that could happen to us after the initial research itself. Well, Wichtenauer's purpose these days is to try to bring together all of the source materials that we study, especially for the martial arts from the 15th and 16th centuries and before. When I was starting HEMA 13 years ago, it was very difficult to access all the source materials. There was a few resources scattered online, they were hard to find. There were a few books that were rather expensive. By and large, if you wanted to study something, you had to begin from scratch and work it out yourself. So Wittenauer exists to try and alleviate that entire problem and create one source where you can go and find out everything that you, that you need to know about a particular treatise, a particular master, to begin your study. And you can branch out from there. But as far as locating the source materials, getting them transcribed and translated and making them available, we're trying to take care of that problem forever and have it done so that the next generation of sword fighters won't have to go through those problems. The study of HEMA has evolved over the years. Um, I think people have become much smarter and much more creative in looking uh, at other sort of supporting uh, sources and data to try to um, get more information uh, about the relevant context for how these techniques work. Like uh, statues, for example, uh, how they portray fighting, if that's the case, or, or just depictions of fighting in, in other sources than martial arts sources to complete the picture. I had a um, researcher who was here a um, year and a half ago who was looking at a painting and was looking at uh, St. George uh, on a horse and just how his body was absolutely you know, unified with the horse. And uh, he said, based on his uh, equitarian researches, that's you know, exactly the pose he should have been in in order to power a, power a blow. For antiquity, there is no manuscript of master d'armes, so we rely on archaeological sources, archéologiques, direct or indirect, des uh, mosaïques, des fresques, des lampes à huile, des bijoux, uh, des objets du quotidien, ou pour les gladiateurs, des casques directement qui ont été découverts à Pompéi, par exemple. So it's out there in a lot of a lot of ways, and often you don't know it's there until you stumble across it. 
Fast forward to the, to the Howard Walden collection, um, which itself has an interesting history because Howard Walden at the beginning of the 20th century was a great collector of fencing books. When he died, he passed it on to his heirs and essentially it got, you know, this great collection of fencing books got stuck in a barn in, in one of the home counties and you know, it was only rediscovered again a few decades ago. Um, it's now a permanent or semi-permanent loan at the Wallace. A couple of years ago, the Wallace Collection um, had an exhibition, uh, The Noble Art of the Sword. A chap called Joshua Pendragon was the assistant curator, and he gave a link to a list of works that were in the Wallace Collection, and I started emailing him because there's some interesting stuff in there. And then we started saying, you know, hang on, on this list of the holdings, there's a reference to Gigante 1608. Now, you know, there's a couple of fencing bibliographies over the centuries that list a Gigante 1608 as a reprint of the 1606, which in itself isn't that interesting because fencing books get reprinted all the time. However, we were aware that Marchioni in 1847 makes some quite specific claims about what's in Gigante's second book. One day I happened to be here. There was a day with guest lectures about various um, subjects relating to the sword and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, can we have a look at the, the Howard Walton collection? And, uh, and the staff were like, yeah, sure, it's just there, you know, pointing to a filing cabinet and we uh, opened it up and you know, immediately, as you start flicking through the plates, you see that it's, it's different stuff to his first book, and you see the cutting, and you see the buckler, the dagger, dagger against spear. You know, we knew immediately. It was the second book that had only been rumoured to exist. Within fencing circles, no one had ascertained that it, that it existed until that point. Navadi gave us a facsimile in 1902. Francesco Navadi. Unfortunately, it's hard to say how accurate this facsimile is because some art critics have looked at it and said that it looks like a 19th, 20th century redrawing of a medieval manuscript more than it looks like a medieval manuscript. So until we get those scans of the original, we won't know how reliable these pictures are. One of the questions that comes up a lot is how do we know that these masters had any idea what they were doing? The most honest answer is we don't. There's a myth among some of the HEMA practitioners that because a source is older, it is somehow more authentic or more authoritative. And that's not necessarily true. Kind of goes hand in hand with that is this idea that just because it was written down in the past means that it's an unquestionable source, which again is not always true. There were bad fencers in the past just as there are bad fencers today. When we're attempting to interpret a manuscript, you kind of have to start from an assumption that the person that wrote it knew what they were talking about. And obviously we've got no way of knowing that until we've got it to work, or not, as the case may be. To stand any chance of coming away with a workable system, you have to make the assumption that they're right, but you need to be aware that you've made that assumption so that you can at least be objective about it. We don't know that they knew what they were doing, but we have some evidence that they did. I mentioned uh, Fiore earlier, the Fiore de la Berry, an Italian swords master, claims to have fought, I believe, five duels wearing nothing but gloves in his sword and came away unshamed. I don't know if that means he killed five men. I don't know if that means he managed not to get hit. I don't, we don't know exactly what that means. I, at least I don't. But we, we have indications that this guy was real, that his students were real people, and we have some records of some of his more famous students. Prior to books being printed, well, those were expensive projects. So getting the funding from those usually came from a patron of some type or so on. As a general rule, we tend to think that the patrons are getting the better quality guys, but there's no way to prove that definitively. Politics and, you know, rubbing shoulders was always going on. Masters disagree with each other all the time. Um, to take the most obvious example, you know, the English polemicist George Silver, you know, wrote his, uh, his rant saying how Italian fencing was useless and they got each other killed. A lot of his specific claims that, you know, Italians never cut are just simply untrue if you look at the treatises. But by looking at the specific areas where people disagree, you actually get a lot of insight into, you know, whether this master has misunderstood one point of it or it makes you think about the fine tactical points like cut versus thrust. I can find examples like Camilla Palladini, whose manuscript rests in the Wallace collection here. He he agrees with George Silver, he says, you know, some people say the cut is slow, but on many occasions in front of great lords, I've asked fences to thrust at my face, and each time I've been, been able to cut them before they thrust me. His explanation is that he can move his wrist quicker than, than someone can move his foot, which, you know, is something that George Silver might have said. So, you know, actually by looking deep into the scholarship, a lot of these apparent contradictions wash away. We know that, that Lichtenauer is quoted for about 200 years after he's dead. That, that fencing students and teachers continued to 
believe that what was taught by Lichtenauer and by Lichtenauer students was valuable. And what I see and what I have seen over the last 15 years as I have progressed through this is that the historical techniques work. They work in a competitive context. They work in a casual fist fence with your buddies in the training school kind of context. And I have no reason to believe that they would not work in a life or death mortal context, assuming that the technique is performed correctly with the right amount of intensity, the right amount of intent by someone who knows what they're doing and uses that technique within its correct context. And that becomes the whole martial art. What is the technique? How do I do it? When do I use it? And if you can bring those pieces together, these techniques work. And I think that's how we know the masters knew what they were talking about, because we do it now. I do a lot of modern wrestling as well. And what for me is, is very sad about the modern wrestling systems is that they've been very sportified. And um, a lot of the techniques, techniques are based on rules that don't make any actual sense. And when you go back to the historical sources, you get a whole other perspective, a much more true perspective, if you will, of what wrestling is actually about. Swords are sexy, and most people are attracted to Hema to do the long sword. It's big, it's cool, it's fast, it's hard. But medieval sources tell us that all fighting comes from wrestling. It is a good question, if you have a sword, why wrestle? And the answer is because when you come close enough to each other, you are now in wrestling distance, despite the fact that you have a sword. There are optimal distances to apply various sets of knowledge. In particular, what I study is, is the German system that's based off of Johannes Lichtenauer's writings. And we are admonished over and over to attack whatever openings our opponent gives us. And so the wrestling uh, curriculum gives us another opportunity, another way to attack those openings, to take the moments that are given to us. It's in the wrestling that you learn how to exploit fueling, feeling between opponents. It's in wrestling that you learn how, if he pushes to pull, if he pulls to push. And all of these things translate immediately up to when swords cross. And that way, all of the lessons from all of our weapons apply to wrestling and vice versa. It really is the universal translator between weaponry. For instance, when two longsword fighters come close, one may remove his left hand and try to use the pommel to hit his opponent. A medieval person would see that as wrestling. And in fact, a lot of the plays that get used for the hilt in the pommel of the sword are dagger plays. It's basically about, uh, in the end, taking control of your opponent and being able to manipulate uh, your own and your opponent's balance in the way that it gains you an advantage. Medieval wrestling is primarily a stand-up jacket wrestling system. So um, it involves gripping onto the clothing that your opponent is wearing, and likewise your opponent is gripping onto your clothing, and you can use these um, to leverage your opponent, to throw them, um, to trip them, maybe to break limbs if necessary, depending on the, on the particular contest or, or even life and death situation the wrestling might be used in. Wrestling in a medieval idea really encompassed not only the sport of wrestling, but also self-defense on the street. So you might find yourself wrestling with no weapons or wrestling with weapons, but the same techniques apply. You know, if you had to look for a modern analog that would be the closest thing, you might look to maybe even Japanese judo, surprisingly, for many people. But again, it's a stand-up, jacketed system. The sporting contests that we know about in medieval wrestling, how they competed friendly with each other in wrestling, was to the throw. They didn't roll on the ground very much. There wasn't pins, um, not submissions, not chokes. They saved that for serious encounters. In play, it was to the throw. And they counted a throw very simply, just anything but the foot, knees, or hands touching the ground. If you deposited someone on the rear end, that's a throw.
if you don't practice with a sharp sword, if you don't ever test cut, you're going to miss facets of, of what it means. And you're going to miss out on conclusions that you could have made if you trained with sharp swords. Sharp weapons are good for doing solo drills uh, to test cut. And you can work with partner drills with sharps as well, with someone that you really trust. But you really need to trust that person. At the New York Historical Fencing Association, we actually train for, although it's kind of unrealistic, we're, we're training with the idea that if we're in a position where we need these swords to protect our lives or to take the life of someone else, we want to make sure that we're using it in such a way that we're, you know, kind of every motion is effective, whether it's cutting or thrusting. If you fence with sharp swords, you're going to realize that sharp edges cut into each other, so they stick like this, you know. A blunt edge, like this, will slide. A sharp edge doesn't, it cuts into the, the other edge. When you're training, it's so important to have all these different tools because if you're doing a bind where two swords come together and are gripping each other and the tension and feedback from that play is vital to understanding the next move. If you're using something that's a slippery edged training weapon like um, a nylon waster or a, a wooden waster, it's, it's not going to give you the same experience and it'll distort your understanding. You don't have to train every day with a sharp sword, but you need to train with a sharp sword from time to time to get a grasp of these things. It'll change the way you grip the sword. It'll change the strength that you put into your strikes because you're not trying to beat somebody with the sword. You're trying to cut and slide across the exposed areas. You look at bad examples of fighting, like for example in a lot of uh, computer games, and you see these big heroic warriors pulling this enormous sword out of their back and slamming it down upon the metal of their opponent. It's completely ineffective, so why are you going to smash your beautiful expensive weapon against somebody's armor when you could take it and cut it across something that's exposed? Even just something that simple, you wouldn't understand that if you didn't know how a cutting-edged weapon worked. Uh, probably the best way to sum it up is to say that there is no perfect HEMA training tool for, for any weapon. Uh, there is always the trade-off between uh, safety versus um, you know, what is the most realistic uh, training tool. The better way to think about it is you know, what, what are the, uh, the best training approaches uh, uh, to get everybody all these different skill sets they, they ultimately would like to, to have, uh, and then, you know, how does the equipment fit in? In terms of the modern HEMA revival, I mean, the first point to make is that people have been looking at earlier styles of fencing for a long time. For example, another master, Costantino Calaroni, quotes Morozzi, a guy from 1711 who's completely different to a book published in, in 1536 you know, is conscious of, of the names of these historical masters. Into the beginning of the 19th century, we had Belgian guilds still practicing with long swords. So long after long swords were obsolete in civilian life and in the battlefield, people were still using them for vegetable sport, essentially. Fast forward into the early 20th century, we had the first kind of attempt at, at a HEMA revival. And we have guys like Hutton, guys like Jelly in Italy. It didn't continue, but I wouldn't say it was unsuccessful. I guess the First World War disrupted a lot of Europe and that generation of uh, early HEMAists, let's say, seemed to have fizzled out around the 20s. In 1981, I went to my local library and uh, I, I kid you not, I did a interlibrary loan request for medieval fencing manuals. And out of the blue, I got a, a copy of the 1965 transcription of Sigmund Ringeck uh, by a guy named uh, Martin Wierschen, who was a German who transcribed uh, that fencing manual. And I self-taught uh, so that I could read um, Sigmund Ringeck's uh, fencing manual. And that was how it started for me. So by about 1982, uh, I was able to understand at about the 90% point what I was reading in that manual. Not to say that I was doing the techniques correctly, but I could read it, I could understand it, uh, and I started working on it then. The interesting thing at that point, that was way pre-internet. And so I was working on that completely in isolation. In the early days of the historical European martial arts community, in the, in the HEMA community, uh, we were all self-taught. Uh, we were all looking for something, and so that, that, who was that earliest teacher? That earliest teacher was a book in the backyard and a wooden stick and getting hit upside the head by, by a friend. 
we began to seek out people who knew a little bit more, some of the, the early teachers. Uh, but even then, in, in that time, what was really going on is that you had someone who, who knew more or who claimed to know more, who was able to, to guide you. When it really came down to interpretation, we were on our own. So initially, who taught me defense was a little bit of John Clements, a little bit of the internet, a little bit of Christian Tobler, uh, a lot of self-study and getting hit upside the head with a, with a stick that you didn't want to get hit with because we were too dumb to wear masks back then. The whole time you're advancing to keep this posture. Don't stand up. Don't lean back. It's very common when I'm going to do this in class. If you get your hand on the We see so many people who have trained under teachers who have never needed to go through that same process of discovery that there's a, a fear, maybe a legitimate fear in the community that that, that attachment to the source is, is getting lost or could get lost. I think HEMA can be done without reading the sources, a translated copy, um, but I don't think it can be done to the best I don't think every human practitioner needs to do research. I do think every human practitioner needs to be educated about the sources. We need to make sure that our students know that the master isn't the guy up in front of the classroom. The master is the guy who wrote the stuff down. Even if you know your interpretations differ from somebody else's interpretation, you are still at least informed by somebody who really used these arts. And there's no more people like that alive, so we have to learn it from the sources. How do we do our HEMA, right? We do our HEMA the way the master said to do the HEMA. The big question is, how did the master say to do the HEMA? Sticking to the source is important. It has to be kept in mind. I'm not saying it's a sin being tempted to stray from the source. If you stray too far, you're losing the H in HEMA, maybe the E even. You're just doing something new, something else, something different. If we're all just learning from somebody else, what we're learning is a modern sword art based on historical sources. What we want to be doing is constantly getting closer to the way that it was done and discovering the way that it was done as part of that path. And if you haven't read the material, if you aren't intimately familiar with the material, you can't be on that path. The third master of dagger. <clears throat> Here's a comparison of the images. I think it's a pretty safe bet they're probably doing the same thing. Um, I mean, I can't be 100% sure. What Fiore says is you will go to the ground because of your lack of knowledge and in armor, in armor this is a particularly safe throw. And then basically talks about how this is an awesome throw and it will throw you on the ground a whole lot and you'll be totally dead. Basically, this whole paragraph says nothing at all about how the technique is done. Then we go over to the German stuff and not only does he give us a whole huge paragraph, but he explains how many steps to take and where to take them and gives you a whole huge explanation of the exact mechanics of the throw. It is an old debate. Should we study one manuscript and, and stick to it uh, as a canon or should we try to have more of a holistic approach and work with several manuscripts? And it all comes down to your own goal. Uh, some people like to work with only one manuscript because they want to try to recreate that specific style or art. Let's say, for example, you want to work only with uh, Achille Marozzo from the Bolognese school, while others want to become efficient fighters with a specific weapon, and then they draw from a number of, of various sources everything that they think can enhance their own skill or and, and knowledge. When I fight, I like winning. Um, so I draw on whatever I think you know is appropriate to that time. I really prefer to get my techniques out of many, as many as different three sizes as possible, and then choose to ones that adapt better to my body types and to my skill set and to my strengths. So even if you're perhaps doing a different style of, of backsword or sabre or longsword or anything else, you can still apply those different lessons back to, uh, to your own fighting. Some systems are more compatible than others. For example, if you study 19th century sabre, if you look across uh, Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, all of the sabre sources from the 19th century share a lot of similarities. Many of them are, are very modern in how they're written. And you can, it's maybe possible to understand hope uh, only by reading hope, I, I would assume. However, there are, some, there are some systems which are really quite a bit more different. For example, if you look at I-33 sword and buckler and you look at Morozzo sword and buckler or Bolognese sword and buckler, uh, they're quite different. They stand differently, they hold the buckler differently, they cut in different ways, uh, they deal with attacks in quite fundamentally different ways. 
So you could mix Morozzo from the 16th century and I-33 from the late 13th century, but I don't think that they would necessarily go together very well as a system. As for the historical integrity of it, that's a personal choice. Obviously, if you want to recreate the fencing style of a certain place and period, then you stick to the sources of that place and period. I've always found every club that I've visited to be very welcoming and excited and interested because the sharing of knowledge is what is the lifeblood in HEMA. The HEMA community is very open source. That means a lot of things. One is that there are very few professionals in what we do. These are mostly an, an amateur community. And the way to get credibility and respect in that uh, community is by sharing your information. These days we can do YouTube videos and actually show what we're talking about as well, which can make it a lot clearer because we're talking about a physical topic. So it helps to illustrate uh, the points that we make online. And they get discussed and debated and questioned, or peer reviewed basically by the rest of the community. But internet is a communication tool that can only take you so far. There is nothing quite like actually being in person with someone. Uh, and, and having them quickly walk you through something that you spent months over the internet trying to explain. And being able to very quickly go back and forth and exchange ideas, again, that's, that's a hugely valuable thing. We have a huge number of events, which is weekend or long weekends of workshops. Lectures and classes on how to do these things and tournaments. One of the great things about martial arts events like Fight Camp, um, especially for people who do things that are quite fringe, like European martial arts, is that you get to learn um, from different instructors who would actually have slightly different interpretations to each other. Some of my favourite discussions with people over HEMA have been very, very heated going, no, 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 there's no way that this can work. Absolutely, you are completely and utterly wrong. You're absolutely wrong. There's, you could not be more wrong if you had a hat with wrong written all over it and you're too wrong on your face. And then you go away and quietly when you're sitting on the train and going away from the event or you're going away from someone else's house, you end up giving them a text or you end up giving them an email and going, you know what? That principle you said, that actually works. If you put it in this context and then quite often they'll go, you know what you were saying? That works. So even when we are at each other's throats or if we're biting or if we're freely exchanging information, the information does get transferred. And I think even quite often, if we don't want to admit it, we still always learn from whatever someone else has said. But then we also have these events as a way to bring the community closer, establish bonds between people face to face in order to bring in beginners so they can see this wonderful community that we have. Uh, take a few beginners class and maybe try out uh, some weapon styles that they're not practicing regularly at home in, the, in their home club. For me, my perspective has always been that these major events has been the real engine behind the HEMA community. These different events will continue to grow and hopefully be a really good nexus uh, for people to come and learn, not only learn what it's about, but for the people who've been doing it for quite some time, uh, also, you know, remind them what it is that they, they really love about all this. What I am worried about is making sure you won't have the shoulder strength and the forearm strength to be able to hold the weapon out, right, to be able to perform the correct technique, all right? So for that reason, we're not going to engage our hips or our feet like we would when we cut the rail. This is just essentially an arm, shoulder, back, core kind of exercise. We live in the 21st century, but the art was written at a time where people were much more physically active, as a general rule. And if they had access to a proper diet, they were in good shape. Uh, so we can argue about if we should practice with uh, 15th century shoes or 21st century shoes, but we should also consider if we should actually try to train with a 15th century uh, body. It basically means that you have to work out. It kind of goes back to goals. If the, the, the aim of the club is just to explore this, the martial arts and walk through it, and they don't fence much, or when they fence, they fence very lightly, fitness is not so much an important factor. But for those clubs who are more interested in, say, competitions, fitness will become an issue. There are very few sports as active as ours that do not incorporate physical training. So it's a non-issue for me, really. Fitness is just a tool. It's not a matter of being fit or being sharp. It's a matter of knowing what your body can do. The more you know your body and the more your body can do, well, the better martial artist you can be. One of the great things with HEMA, especially sword fighting, is that you don't really have to be young and fit and sharp and tall and muscular. This technicality of sword fighting means that you can be old but still know the tricks and perform quite well. 
So I think for somebody who perhaps doesn't feel very comfortable in their body, learning to fight with weaponry is a great way to go because it takes the focus off you. It extends the force that you can create and it gets you moving. And anytime you move, you become more in your body. So it's, it's a good feedback cycle. Remember, what we do is martial arts and you eventually get hurt sometimes. It's not the goal, it's not the aim, it's not the joy of doing HEMA, but it happens. So you need, in order to also make these physical knowledge yours, to think of your own safety and the safety of your, of your partners. We do have manufacturers now who are actually looking to produce gear for us, which is a huge boost. When I, when I started up 12 years ago, when I was 17, we had old fencing masks, welding gloves and sticks, basically. Uh, it worked at a time, but as the community grows and we become more and more professional, we also see manufacturers either from outside of the HEMA community taking an interest in what we do and wanting to pro provide gear for us, or actual actual practitioners starting their own companies, which I think is the best idea because they know what the fencer needs. We need equipment that, that can make keep people safe. And this is growing. The interest is there and the, the people who need the equipment, they're asking for it. The market won't grow to its potential until the safety equipment is there. Mothers are not going to be eager to bring their children to, you know, get into this program if, you know, broken arms and legs are, you know, a, a monthly occurrence. Hands are most, among the most common injuries, like 80% of the injuries in HEMA are hand related. Uh, and everyone knows in daily life how frustrating or complex it is if you break a finger. And my biggest concern is, of course, if a blade breaks and it penetrates the, the, the body, because that can be the, the end, you know, for someone. That's the scary one, right? Um, you know, our blades with the, we have blunted tips and usually there's tape on the tips and a variety of things that, you know, keep it that it would be very difficult to, to penetrate one of our jackets. Um, the concern always is, you know, in that broken blade situation, the rare freak occurrence um, that that were to happen and then a thrust would follow through. You can see the gear check is getting more and more seriously done. Like first I'll wear something over here and then no, you should wear something that prevents a thrust if the sword breaks and it penetrates. Często ludzie pytają się u nas, w jakim sprzęcie powinni trenować, jak, jak dużo ochraniaczy powinni na siebie zakładać, czy trenować z kurtką, czy bez kurtki, czy zakładać dodatkowe ochraniacze, czy y, sama kurtka jest wystarczająca. The thing we must remember in, in designing equipment is the style of fencing we are simulating. And it is not armored fencing, it is blowsfechten. Uh, or fencing without any protection on. It's kind of a fine balance because every time you wear something as protection, it does change your, the way your body moves. It's just a part of the way things are. You're going to move differently in sports gear than you are if you're not wearing it. So simulating an unarmored fight, but still wearing protection because you don't want to blow out your knees or have your hands smashed up, it's a massive challenge. From the feedback we, we always hear, oh yeah, it's very nice, but can it be more flexible? Can it be lighter? Uh, this is the, the hardest part of the, of the development phase. Right now we have two things going on. The tournament scene is really increasing in popularity, but you also have people training the real techniques and a lot of hybrids, let's be honest. But if you're training the real techniques, you should be able to train without gear or with the least restraining gear, because otherwise you cannot really interpret the real techniques if you're limited by gear. But if you don't use any gear in training and then suddenly you want to do a tournament, then you feel the restrictions, so you won't be able to use the techniques you have been training. And I think that is what a lot of people aspire to. Yeah. Normally your sword should keep you safe and what we see is a lot of gear prevents you to build your swords to the extreme position you want to go to and because of that you do get hit in the hand where normally you wouldn't get hit. So the protection makes sure you need the protection because you cannot use your sword to protect yourself. Jedną z głównych przeszkód dla rozwoju HIMA, dla rozwoju szermierki historycznej, historycznej według mnie, był fakt posiadania niewystarczająco dobrego sprzętu ochronnego, który zawodnicy starali się wyszukiwać z różnych źródeł, jak na przykład ochraniacze motocyklowe, kurtki czy sprzęt do szermierki sportowej, 
do hokeja czy też różnych innych dyscyplin sportowych. I go into a sporting goods store. I just went in to get new knee pads and I said, okay, so look, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be getting hit with a long sword and the one the knee pads I have, they gape open at the top and it can just cut down into them. I need something that straps better. And so the people are looking at me with these eyes like, well, I don't know what you need. Klienci, zawodnicy cały czas poszukiwali sprzętu, który będzie odpowiedni dla nich. Czegoś, co będzie od początku do końca zaprojektowane do walki na miecze. We're still trying to get the best thing that will work when what we need is the best thing that's made for it. Sprzęt do szermierki sportowej nie spełnia wszystkich wymogów, które powinien posiadać sprzęt do szermierki historycznej, chociażby z tego względu, że waga broni, którą się posługujemy, jest dużo wyższa niż waga broni sportowej. Some products are basically identical, like the fencing mask or, or chest protectors, for example. Some products are similar, needed to be modified, and there are, of course, equipment which are only used in, in HEMA. W szermierce historycznej Potrzebujemy kurtki, która posiada dodatkową warstwę amortyzacyjną i potrzebujemy również ochraniaczy zewnętrznych, które dodatkowo zapobiegają uszkodzeniom stawów, uszkodzeniom kości. One very important uh, gear is the neck protector, which uh, not only protects the, the neck, but also the, the collar bones. The next one, which is also very important, is the uh, back of the head protector, which protects the back of the head, back of the neck. One very crucial part is the, the hand, which uh, needs to be protected, and we've been uh, tackling this problem for a long time. Yeah, it's still unsolved and struggling, but we are not alone. The hand is one of the most complex parts of the human body. You have so much movement going on, and this is of course the place you interact with the sword. You have lots of vulnerable pieces as well. To really come up with a design that gets the energy out of the strike and to disperse it over a sufficient surface area is really hard with the space you have to work with. We always like to make the analogy between music and longsword fencing and HEMA in general. Uh, it is something the ancient masters used to do as well. What for us is important here is that we see the same amount of technical finesse that is required to uh, handle the sword. And this is why uh, we came with the idea that we would like to make a glove, a protective glove, uh, with which you could play a musical instrument. And that's the challenge we, we set ourselves to. The conditions in HEMA are so extreme that we believe the scientific approach is the only right approach to do this. You don't necessarily take something that is already there and try to improve it. You study the conditions of the product you're designing for and you start from scratch with the parameters you get. What are the actions you actually required to take? Not only the sword fighting, but also the grappling. But also, for example, putting gear on and off, also in case of an emergency. We have a partial prototype here, but we had to cover it because of IP issues. So it's slightly thicker now and it moves slightly less optimal, but here you can see. So hidden behind this little sports glove is our prototype. And to show you that it works, um, I'm going to grip the sword first. And you see that I can move around unrestricted and shift from one grip to the other. And it's almost as if I'm not wearing anything. And everything here stays covered, no gaps whatsoever. So a consequence of um, putting our glove in a higher skill and a higher context and involving external investors is that we need to protect our intellectual property uh, because we are looking at something that um, will have to be much bigger than HEMA in order to be, to, to be, to be sustainable. Um, so this is why we haven't been able to show the HEMA community and our backers uh, a lot of details, even though we really, really want to. So in order to be able to put it on the market, we need money. For that, we need IP protection. And because of that, we cannot show anyone anything. For now. <laughs> There is a fancy jacket with my name on it, which is, uh, was almost like an inside joke. Axel Peterson od dłuższego czasu szukał kurtki, która będzie spełniała jego wysokie wymagania jako zawodnik. I was in, uh, in Poland for a competition and I noticed that the Polish fencers had a gambeson with great arm movement in it. Wcześniej używał 
różnych kurtek trenerskich. But the sport fans has never raised their arm about their head as we do some of the time, so the arm, arm, arm mobility is very restricted. It was just because there was some padding to it and because the aesthetics of the jacket was very appealing. Podobał mu się jakby poziom mobilności oferowanej przez, przez nasze, nasze kurtki w tamtym czasie. Odezwał się do nas i stwierdził, że chce, chce taką samą kurtkę, tylko trochę bardziej uwspółcześnioną. Because the Polish fans used more or less a straight up gambeson, which meant, meant it was proper protection and proper movement, but also it was, it was laced. And I thought it would be better if we had zipper, for example, and a whole bunch of changes like that, a throat stopper to catch thrust, and just took it from there. Zrobiliśmy dla niego tą specjalną, specjalną kurtkę. Stwierdziliśmy, że jest to dobry design, jest to dobry, dobry model. Axelowi zależało na tym, żeby rozwijać szermierkę historyczną, więc zgodził się na to, żebyśmy zaczęli produkować tą kurtkę nazwaną jego, jego imieniem, jako osoby, która, która współtworzyła i, i była pierwszym, pierwszym testerem te, tej kurtki. It was supposed to be just a jacket for me. And I asked them to put my name on it, I don't know, maybe they did, as a joke. <laughs> more or less, but it turned out to be a very popular product. There's a lot of things to take into consideration when you're designing a modern HEMA jacket. The first being washability. We all want to be able to throw our stuff in the wash and get it clean. We need a certain protection level that is generally above what you would see um, a medieval man wearing on the street, certainly. Mając doświadczenie wcześniejsze w, z produkcji sprzętu ochronnego dla rekonstruktorów historycznych, dla rekonstruktorów średniowiecza, wiedząc jak działają historyczne wzory, wzory, które, są, które powstały do tego, aby były używane właśnie z taką bronią jak miecz, jak miecz jednoręczny, jak miecz dwuręczny, pasują do tego, żeby mo, można je było wykorzystać obecnie e, dla rozwoju szermierki histor historycznej. The cut of the garment is vitally important um, to allow us to raise our arms clear above our heads in ways that aren't necessary in modern fencing. We also have a different aesthetic. What we think is attractive on a man's body is very different from what a medieval man thought was attractive on his body. And that changes some things. It very much depends on the focus of the individual HEMA practitioner. What are they looking to get out of their HEMA experience? Z jednej strony jesteśmy zależni od wzorów historycznych, z drugiej strony możemy sobie pozwolić na odrobinę ekstrawagancji przy projektowaniu i dodać trochę stylistycznych, współczesnych smaczków, które ludzie zajmujący się szermierką historyczną doceniają. It looks modern, it looks fresh. It doesn't particularly pull off anything medieval at all. It's very much a modern take. We were told by several Hemais um, that it's a, it's a modern sport actually, so uh, it should look modern. But then there are Hema practitioners who very much want to work in garments that are made in the style of a medieval garment, even if it's modern materials. Again, it's up to the individual practitioner of what they're interested in. And that works out well, I think, for um, the producers of equipment because there are a lot of little niches to be filled because everyone has a little bit different approach to their HEMA experience. The other thing that, that really resonates with the, the HEMA community as I know it is a matter of self-presentation. Czynnikami takimi, które pozwalały na pewną unifikację, było chociażby to, że du duża część zawodników zaczęła używać podobnego sprzętu, czyli jakiegoś rodzaju pikowane kurtki. Drugą rzeczą było to, że wszyscy chcieli mieć czarny sprzęt. Chcieli mieć czarny sprzęt, żeby odróżnić się od e, szermierki sportowej, która z kolei wymaga podczas zawodów, podczas treningów używania białych kurtek, białych spodni, białych skarpet. We start, start to be a household name, where people actually know what you mean when you say that you do HEMA. Now, when that happens, and it's just about to happen, uh, the reputation that we have uh, at that point in time is the reputation that we will have for a very long time. It's something that we'll have to work. I work with advertising and this just, you know, this is just one of those things where it's the way it is.
So it's very important for us in our community that as we study a form of combat, for example, armored combat, that we're doing it right, at least as best as we understand right. And that means not taking 12th century kit against 15th century kit. So if we're gonna do armored combat, we're gonna look good. We're gonna look like people who are serious martial artists studying, studying a serious martial art, which happens to include armor. We don't wanna look like we're playing some kind of a game. Let's present ourselves in a fashion that is professional, that is athletic, that says serious martial artist, and if you are a competitor, that says serious competitor in the modern world. We don't want to give an impression that actually turns people away from what we're doing who would have done it if not for an issue of perception. In 2011, we did the first live stream of the tournament finals, and that turned out to be very, very popular. So we've done that ever since. And I know there are other events that's also done the same thing, Long Point, for example, in, in, in Washington. You know, it was an experiment when they did this for the first time, and we really didn't know how it was going to turn out. That also brought a lot of attention to the tournament. Maybe that's another reason why tournaments are popular. People are hoping to get on TV. We realized, though, that it had a lot of potential for outreach. Uh, I think at about the same time that we did that first one, uh, there was a little video that was done here by a guy named Matthias Rierlin, uh, where he attached a GoPro camera uh, to the end of a sword, and so you were actually getting the view down the sword uh, as a couple of us swung the sword around. And he took that video, uh, he put it to some music, he put it up on YouTube, and it went viral. And when that happened, it really opened our eyes. It was so unexpected. And so I think, uh, you know, the guys at uh, GHFS started really taking a view that uh, this was a real tool for outreach. Uh, so started working on it a little more from that point of view. It was part of a larger scheme to make everything a little more pro professional so that we were taken a little more seriously. The thing with uh, an online community is that sometimes the person who posts the most uh, is considered uh, the best fencer. And that's of course not the case. Tournaments actually started out as a way of asking people who claim knowledge over the internet to put up or shut up. If you're really trying to uh, look at the question of, you know, will this work under stress? There are very few ways to actually do that that are as good as a tournament at the moment. Competition is an environment where I can be absolutely certain that my opponent is not cooperating with me. I can be absolutely certain that they're not helping me, that they're not even subconsciously trying to make my technique work. They're not trying to make it look good. They're not trying to do anything at all for me except beat me up. I think people confuse the idea that tournaments are like a, a real fight. They're not. All of this, there's always going to be a level of approximation. They're not a simulation of a proper duel. In a duel you're thinking about life and death, those are two different goals. People don't approach it as a life and death situation because they know that lives are not at stake. You need to create rules that enhance the behavior you want to see, technical proficiency, technical variety. What are the kinds of combative behaviors that you want to encourage? And that's how you develop these rules and use them to actually get people to fence better. Historically, competitions of different types were part and parcel of HEMA, of the real historical traditions and the historical practices. You can take a look at Germany in the 1500s and you can see that they were having a Festschule or a public fencing competition uh, every weekend for a series of months. So, you know, and this is in one town. These old historical rule sets existed for a different function or we think they existed for a different function than our modern rule sets. The historical rule sets were games, games of skill, using fairly limited and restricted skill sets within the martial arts of the time. But we need to remember that most of the modern tournaments is a modern invention. They're not representative of a duel, it's not a battlefield situation, it's not a, a historical tournament, it's something else, because we're trying to achieve slightly different things. If I'm learning 15th century German longsword, you know, Ernst Festens, right? How to fight to kill a guy. I want to be able to stab a guy in the face. I want to be able to grapple and bash him in the head with my pommel, as we see in the source material. None of that would be allowed under historical rule sets. But we also borrow a lot of things from historical rule sets, like the afterblow, for example. When you hit someone, they're allowed within one fencing tempo. In other words, 
immediately after you hit them. They're allowed to try and hit you back. If you touch your opponent, he's not just going to fall down and die. Most probably, if you hit him in, in, in the shoulder, and it's not his weapon shoulder, he's going to strike you back. And there are so many times where we have historical accounts of that happening. And that means that you need to strike the opponent and either keep on striking him without getting hit or rushing into grapple or step out and cover. Uh, it's art for fencing, but it's also just common sense. But for us who are training a complete system without that tradition, we also need to, to experiment with what happens if all targets are open, you can do wrestling, you can do thrusts, you can do cuts, you can do 100 cuts, you can even do the Mordschlag where you turn and you hit with a, the hilt. Uh, you know, you can punch, you can kick, you can elbow. What happens? Why would these arts that they invented win over someone who's just a, a big person, a strong person, a brawler? We want to create uh, an environment that is as free as possible for people to do the things that they believe are the right interpretations of these texts and these sources that we have. To do that well and for competition to be part of that, you know, we have to understand the context of the primary sources to begin with. So if we want to see beautiful technical fencing, that calls for one type of rule set. If we are interested in who would win a fight, in a back alley with a sword, then we have to have a much more open rule set. However, that is going to be more scrappy, that's going to be people bearing down on you. There's no point lamenting that we don't see the beautiful techniques when we set up conditions that the masters themselves would have recognised aren't going to bring out the beautiful techniques. If martial arts is the application of good technique at the right time, maybe I have great technique, but I haven't figured out when to use it. I'm not much of a martial artist. Along the same token, I might have the most perfect instincts in the world as a fighter, but if I don't have the right technique, one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to get my butt kicked, or I'm going to fence in a way that everybody and their grandmother within the HEMA community is going to look at me and say, Jake, what you're doing isn't HEMA. I don't know what you're doing, it seems to be working, but it's not HEMA. If you win, but you do it poorly, with really ugly fencing or things that people don't think are, are proper techniques, you're not actually going to get a lot of uh, positive feedback from that. You're not going to be uh, the hero of HEMA, but just because you won Swordfish. When we're looking at tournaments, I think one of the things we have to think about is just revealing flaws. When we try to do a technique, we want our partners to, you know, take advantage of any mistakes that we make. We want to do a better technique. And tournaments are unparalleled in the ability, you know, because there's someone else who was trying to actively hit you and get the points themselves. I'm going to really learn how that technique works at full speed, full intensity, against somebody who absolutely doesn't want it to happen, and what kind of mechanical tweaks need to happen there. What do I need to do with my feet, with my hips, with my hands? If it works, why? Remember that. If it didn't work, why? Remember that. Did it not work because I'm out of shape and I'm too slow? Is that even a feature that we need for that technique? It allows me to really test that technique. It allows me to test myself. How well do I know the material that I claim to know, that I claim to teach? I know for a fact that Anders Leonard entered this uh, tournament, uh, this swordfish, with the specific idea of, of practicing techniques. And I watched him carry out some techniques. If we get the context of the competitions right, um, the things that work very often will be things that are advised in the books. You look at Elisa Keskinen. Uh, from Finland, uh, who won the, the Lady's Longsword, uh, she was doing some seldom used techniques. She, she used a technique called the Krumpau. Uh, and not only using the Krumpau, but she used, you know, the right hand version is the common one. There is a left hand version that's de described, uh, but she actually used it uh, in the tournament. That's the first time I've seen anyone do it. Looks like okay, uh, huh? interesting. Another Krumpau, ah, Krumpau Krumpa. that landed. Ended on a Krumpau. And an afterblow, that was interesting. A Krumpau from the left, scored by Two Elisa points. Keskinen. Nice to see that. She's showing that uh, she knows the sources, she trains from the sources, she can use it effectively, she can score with that technique, and she's not just using it in the pool fencing, it, fencing. she's using it in the finals, and she's winning for first place. That's just great. Thank you.
There are certainly concerns people have about tournaments turning HEMA too much into a sport and not enough of a, a practical martial art. We need to be cautious that we don't push the competitive side so far that we move away from the elements of recovering historical systems into the realm of we just have a, a sport for sport's sake. But having gone through it with those concerns and actually participated in tournaments, I think the benefits greatly, greatly outweigh uh, the negatives. I think that the popularity of HEMA is a two-edged sword in that the more popular it becomes, the more standardized it has to be. The good thing about standardization is leading to the fact that it's going to be a safer competitive environment. It's going to lead to the ability to mass produce the items and equipment that we so dearly want that currently cost a great deal. The dangers of standardizing anything are that it's going to limit any kind of continued growth. What if in 20 years time, somebody went, oh my goodness, this makes so much more sense now. I've just done this particular mystery move and it's going to completely change the way that we've previously understood this. If you've got something that's standardized in place, it's going to limit the growth of something that at the moment we all love because it is so excitingly new. Having said that, I personally believe that it's not all about tournaments. You know, tournaments, I think, just seem to be at the moment uh, and maybe for some time to come, sort of the popular sexy component of uh, HEMA. And the fact of the matter is, a lot of the people who do this get into HEMA because they want to fight. They want to be sword fighters. That's what, you know, that's what young men want to do in particular, and more and more young women as well. People want to be sword fighters. You know, they don't just want to pose. Uh, if they're going to practice the techniques, they want to have a forum in which they can actually use them. If you talk to the people who actually win these tournaments, you ask them, are tournaments the most important thing? I think most of them would very quickly say no. I've been driving and creating the, the sporting scene of HEMA, but I really hate the sportification aspect of it. My club is one of the most successful clubs uh, as far as tournament goes. We never practice for tournaments. We don't practice by the rule sets or, or anything like that. And, and the boys and girls that I train in my club are not thinking about only winning the tournaments. They're thinking about self-development. And as long as we can foster that culture and see the tournament as a vehicle to improve as fencers in general, um, tournament has great value. They're a useful motivator for people to, you know, just put in the hours week on week and, and then to, to train against a non-compliant person from a different school they haven't trained with before. My greatest kick is when I'm able to perform a technique that the world hasn't seen for 500 years. Yeah. And if I can do it in sparring, that's good. If I can do it in tournaments, it's even better because there's more stress and it's an uncooperative opponent. So it's, for me, it's a way of measuring how much I have internalized of the art. Where we go with HEMA from now on, I think it's probably going to continue in a, in a similar vein. It will get bigger. It's going to get bigger because people's awareness is increasing. Hopefully, I don't think it will die a death because it's not a fad. It's not something where everyone's going, oh, that's fascinating. You do something that's so different. We must all come and do this. We haven't become a hipster movement yet. It's very, very much a case of it's people who want to do it and are interested in doing it. And I think those people are always going to be about so it's not too big to collapse in on itself. It's still attracting people who have a genuine interest in it as a martial art or as a historical item or whatever. With, you know, uh, all the publicity that we've been getting, HEMA is starting to go mainstream. You're starting to see an interest from the mainstream martial arts community. You're starting to see more of an interest from the mainstream sport fencing community. I'm starting to see people from, you know, you see the CrossFit crowd starting to look at this. That's what I think the big trend is going to be in the future is uh, the mainstreaming of HEMA. I know what I'm about. There really isn't one particular kind of person that does HEMA because people come to it for all different reasons. They might come because they're romantics, they might come because they love the, the movies, and they might come because they want to get in shape. They, they come for all different reasons. There isn't a particular kind of walk of life that I haven't run across in HEMA, or that seems to be really dominant. I know, I know soldiers and cops, management consultants, IT guys, computer specialists, grade school teachers, professional athletes, soccer moms. I mean, I, I've run into all kinds of people who are practicing HEMA. I'm a lawyer, math teacher, freelance writer, criminology degree, student, copywriter, project manager. It's not people who are going to dress up in costumes necessarily, although it is those people too. It's not Dungeons and Dragons nerds, although it is those people as well. It's not your professors from university, although it is them. 
it's not your athlete and your school jock, although it is certainly that guy when you put a sword in his hand. And, and that cross-section runs all the way from the high-level competitive guys all the way down to people who are just showing up to class because swords are neat and they want to take a class. HEMA is one of the most fantastic grassroots movements I've ever seen. It's exciting. You, you can go and learn physical skills that you can put into a fun fighting situation or a stressful competition fighting situation, take your pick, which can also be fun. So, um, getting involved, if you're lucky, um, you know, there will be other groups in your area that have already sort of started uh, building the, the community. Uh, so you just look for, you know, uh, swordplay places. There are also plenty of places, I think, certainly in the U.S. and I imagine elsewhere, that uh, people just kind of have to start out on their own. So the biggest thing is to just reach out. Reach out and find other people that might share your common interests. And you never know what nearby neighbor you have or family member or person that you know um, may also be a closet HEMA person. <laughs> Our oldest student is 70 and, and you know, he's actually pretty decent and pretty fast. That has surprised me, you know, again, because of the really broad demographic. Uh, there are lots of people that are sort of interested in this, but just have never realized it was a thing. So I, I think part of getting involved, if you're doing it on your own, is to just kind of let people know, hey, look, I like doing swords. You know, is this something that uh, anybody else wants to do? Just ask, really. HEMA is very much based on that model that it takes one, two or three dedicated people to, to start a club. And even for the unfortunate people that are just kind of isolated, um, as long as you get the internet, you are never fully isolated when it comes to HEMA. So part of it is also knowing where to go online, uh, you know, various forums online, just Googling things. Uh, you should be very quickly able to, to locate, you know, sort of the nearest club or find somebody else who has interests similar to your own about studying this or that or whatever. HEMA offers everything, but you don't have to you know, you don't have to tick all the boxes if you like. You might not be a top uh, fencer or wrestler, but you are an academic, and without the academics, we will be nowhere. This will just be made up stuff that, that has no value whatsoever. Or you can be a community builder, an organizer, a manager, a judge, anything really. So there are so many ways to contribute to HEMA. It's really multifaceted. You know, if you love languages, history, competition, sport, fitness, it's got everything. If only some of those aspects appeal to you, that's still quite a lot to get on with. The point being, the invitation is out there. Anyone can come and join in. It's an athletic, physical activity. It is a mental activity. It is a scholarly activity. It's a social activity. It's really for anyone who is interested in something that happened, something that was, something that was amazing. And if they're passionate about joining in on that, they're going to be pretty damn welcome. It's a lot easier today than it was 10 years ago. So uh, it's not, you know, there, there are really no excuses not to start a club if you're interested. <laughs>